All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. Welcome to today's webinar, Grant Making at the Grassroots, Building Power for Equitable Systems Change, co-sponsored by F the Funders Committee for Civic Participation. My name is Caitlin Duffy and I'm Senior Associate for Learning and Engagement at the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy, also known as NCRP. NCRP was founded to center the voices of nonprofits and communities in conversations about how philanthropy works and is held accountable. Since 1976, we've advocated for philanthropy that benefits and engages marginalized communities and advances systems change. Let's get a sense of what kind of organizations we have on the call with us today including what types of organizations they represent and what regions they primarily serve. So on this slide, you'll see um, that today a little under half of registrants represent grant-making institutions, with the largest group being private and independent funders. A quarter of registrants represent nonprofits. Welcome. Also, a majority of the work um, that folks are doing is at the national level, closely followed by um, in the Midwest and in the Northeast. Um, we have less representation from the South today, but we hope that those from the region, including all of you, are well aware of our popular As the South Grows project, which we've been doing in partnership with Grantmakers for Southern Progress, which released its fifth report last month. And our colleague Stephanie um, just wrote a blog post on the connection between Power Moves and the As the South Grows project. So I encourage you to check it out on our blog, and we'll include a link in the follow-up email to this webinar. Before we jump into our conversation, I want to encourage you to join it by using the Q&A and chat features in the Zoom platform. Um, if you're joining us from a desktop at the bottom of your screen, you'll see buttons for the Q&A and chat features. So please use the Q&A box specifically for posing questions for me and our speakers um, um, and the chat box for questions, comments, and resources for everyone on the call. I've really try to keep those separate. Um, myself and my colleague Lisa Rangeli will monitor the Q&A, and if you have any technical issues, you may chat me directly for assistance. We encourage you to join us on social media. You'll notice um, handles and a hashtag on our slides. Um, so join us on social media using hashtag Power Moves Equity. My colleagues Jack and Lisa will be joining you live tweeting. And during today's conversation, um, we're going to help grant makers, consultants to grant makers and other philanthropy serving organizations um, get oriented to the build power section of Power Moves, which is NCRP's new philanthropy self assessment toolkit. We hope you've had a chance to download it for free and dig in. If not, um, we'll be sharing some more links for you to do so um, after today's presentation. And today we're honored to be joined by four sector leaders, including our moderator, Daniel Lee, who is executive director of the Levi Strauss Foundation. He is a distinguished member of NCRP's board. And in 2013, the Levi Strauss Foundation received an inaugural NCRP Impact Award. We're also joined by Alejandra Ibanez, who is the lead program officer at Woods Fund Chicago. The Woods Fund, um, received an inaugural NCRP Impact Award also in 2013, and Alejandra is representing her foundation as a participant in the Power Moves Advisory and Peer Learning Group for Funders. Next, we have Rhiannon Rossi, who is Program Officer with the Women's Foundation of California, and Rhiannon is representing the foundation also as a participant in the Power Moves Advisory and Peer Learning Group for Funders. And last but not least, we have Elizabeth Tan, who is founder and principal of ETAN Consulting, has a rich experience in nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. And Elizabeth is a participant in the Power Moves Advisory and Peer Learning Groups for consultants. Um, you can read more about our speakers, including their full bios on the webinars event page on NCRP's website. And for those who are unfamiliar with the learning groups that I mentioned, um, NCRP is piloting two 12-month programs for funders and consultants to grant makers who are committed to using and providing user insights on Power Moves. And you can learn more about both of them on our website. And again, we'll make sure to send links in the webinar follow-up email. 
and um, wanted to give a little bit of background. Um, some of you may know or recall from the first webinar in May um, that Power Moves grew out of NCRP's Philamplify project, which we created to bring honest, unvarnished feedback from grantees, peers, and other community stakeholders to some of the nation's largest foundations to help improve their philanthropy and share learning with the broader sector. And so a little bit more about Power Moves. Many of you who've downloaded the toolkit will recognize this beautiful graphic that gives an overview of the three dimensions that we feature in the guide. Power Moves is not a how-to for equitable, socially just grant making, though we certainly have resources to help you with that too, but rather it's a guide to help funders examine where they are on their journey towards fully embracing equity and justice in grant making operations and leadership. And what's unique about this particular guide is its focus on power. We know that without directly addressing power, we can't make true progress in our communities. And so in this graphic, you'll see the three dimensions and what they represent. And today we're focusing on best practices for building power through grant making, which you'll see reflected in the red on the left. Through NCRP's research, we have found that funders who successfully make grants that build power and advance equity for marginalized communities uh, support systemic change by funding civic engagement, advocacy, and community organizing among marginalized communities. They are explicit about advancing systemic equity for specific marginalized communities and their goals, strategies, and operations. They fund under-resourced communities to build and be their own, build power and be their own agents of change. They fund cross-cutting approaches because they know that building power may not fit into neat, neatly into narrowly defined issue areas. And lastly, they fund for the long term while also being responsive to emerging or urgent opportunities. You can learn more about all of these best practices in the build power section of the toolkit. Um, and, and what questions you need to ask yourself and your stakeholders to know um, how well you're um, building power. The toolkit has excellent tips and questions to both ask both internally and externally to examine where you are and what your next steps might be. So if you'd like to know more about the who, what, when, why, and how of getting started with this guide, we encourage you to watch the recording of our first Power Moves webinar from May. And in the feedback from that presentation, we heard a desire for more practical examples and entry points for the guide, which we're excited to dig into today. And with that, I'll turn it over to our esteemed moderator, Daniel. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's really a delight to be uh, your host and moderator for this grant, grant making at the grassroots webinar. Um, I know that webinars are kind of like the new public radio. Uh, we hope to engage you during the next hour and 15 minutes. We know you have other windows open. We know that multitasking will not be uh, um, efficient or effective, especially with the caliber of these speakers today. Um, I'm delighted to be moderating this because uh, I think the, the Power Moves uh, uh, resource comes at a, at a time um, where it couldn't be more relevant as inequality is the issue of the day. And I think the NCRP recognizes that inequality and power are not just moral issues to get stultified around, but it's about a whole range of practices that we can be empowered around. It's about policies, it's about practices, and it's about culture and really impressed with the way that Power Moves delineates this in a way that we can think about it and act. Um, and I wanted to recognize uh, Lisa Rangeli, a co-author of it. Her, um, she, her window was open before, but um, we couldn't see her photo, but wanted to recognize her, her incredible work along with Jennifer Choi in, in putting this together. And I, I also wanted to recognize Caitlin as the designer of this webinar and for rounding us all up. Um, we are gonna proceed in three parts. Um, over the next um, hour or so. Um, the first will be an intro introductory round where we will be calling upon each of the speakers to give their own deep dive into the topic. Um, and the second round will be a moderated um, conversation, a set of questions that are given to the panelists and um, some or all of the panelists will be answering those. And finally, the third part will be Q&A where we'll be taking questions from the audience. You'll see there's a Q&A button at the bottom. Feel free to fortify that with your, with your questions. Um, and with that, um, it's a delight to be hearing from our panelists. I, um, delighted to be on this, um, on this webinar with these amazing women who all represent organizations um, that I've long admired. 
and who bring wealth of experience, um, not only in philanthropy, but also in the nonprofit sector, in community organizing, um, as well as philanthropic consulting. So there's a variety of vistas to be approaching this topic. And I, I'm, I'm confident that our, our panelists will bring um, deep insight. So the, the first round, I'm gonna be asking each panelist, we'll have about five minutes total. Um, and I'm gonna ask, uh, as far as the deep dive into the uh, into this, this topic to answer three questions. And you, you can, you could, I'll, I'll invite the panelists to spend as much time um, with each of these as they wish. The first is, in your own words, can you tell us what building power means and why this topic matters? And I, I was the one who selected this question. And I think building power is actually, for those of us who support the grassroots, is one of the most important translation exercises in the field of philanthropy today. I notice when I listen to NPR, when I hear people say building power, sometimes it's abundantly clear what that means, and sometimes I'm left um, scratching my head as far as the context. So I'm, I'm, each of the speakers can give a, a two to three sentence capsule what building power means and why the topic matters, number one. Number two, how does a commitment to building power translate in your foundation's work or in your, in your, con your consulting practice? And the third is, could you share an example of impact or tangible results that you're proud of. So each of the speakers have five minutes to cover these, these three questions. What does building power mean? How does the commitment to building power translate in your work? And can you share an example of, of, of tangible benefits that you're proud of? And I know that there, I think three of, three of the four folks here um, on the panel are, are from California. I have a bell that I'll be ringing. We have all kinds of passive aggressive Zen bells here in California. At the four minute mark, I will be ringing the bell, and it's just a cue to ask the speakers. Um, there's so many amazing things to be said, but to move it along, um, to wrap it up within the next minute. All right, fair enough. Our, our first speaker is Alejandra Ibanez, and she is the program officer at the Remarkable Woods Fund in Chicago. Uh, Alejandra was born in Chile, and she settled in the US in the 1970s, first in the East Coast, and then in Chicago. And before joining the Woods Fund, uh, cut her teeth as a community organizer in Chicago's West Side with a deep focus on building grassroots leadership. So um, without any further ado, delighted to hear from Alejandra on the, on the opening questions. Great. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, many thanks, Daniel, for the intro and Caitlin for setting the context for today. Um, and so as an organizer, uh, forgive, you'll have to forgive me, Daniel, I, I, I like to bend the rules. So this first question really about building power is so important that I wrote a, a little bit more than three sentences. Um, but when I think about building power, I think of the work of both our grantees who are doing on the ground work and the work that the foundations have to do, that we have to do ourselves, right? And so, um, as you heard, the Woods Fund is a private foundation. We have historically funded systems change work as an effective strategy to eliminating what we call the brutality of structural racism and poverty. What do we mean by systems change? We define it as changing the systems, the policies, the practices that deny equity to marginalized communities. Um, we fund community organizing, we fund public policy advocacy because we believe that by calling out and changing the policies and practices that are either grounded in racial bias or have a disproportionate impact on marginalized communities and communities of color that will be effective in changing the conditions to create an equitable society. So, you know, we need to build power to do that. Uh, in the community, it's building people power to change those policies and practices. And, and in our foundation, it's using the power of our dollars to invest in community-led work that make that systems change possible. Um, so that's my long answer to that first question. I would say, how, what does that commitment look like in our foundation? Um, it translates into our work um, and at the Woods Fund for the past 10 years, we have made a commitment to using a racial equity framework. Um, so that means that um, we recognize the historical systems and policies that have denied equity to communities, um, historical policies and practices that have, that have led to the racial 
uh, segregation we see at the workplace. Um, I would say specifically in the low income sector of the economy, the inequities we see in public education, housing, public transportation, uh, that is neither equitably funded, um, nor does it give access to communities of color, right? Um, and also we gotta talk about, and for the Woods Fund, it also means digging deeper in what we feel is the um, unconscionable over-policing of, uh, communities of color in the criminal justice system and in the immigration system. Um, this has meant that we fund across issues, right? Um, so we fund organizations in community organizing, we fund organizations engaged in public policy across issues. Um, this has also meant that our board of directors and staff have gone through a pretty extensive racial equity training. We have had to develop a shared language, a shared understanding of what institutional racism is. We take nothing for granted. We have to learn and grow together. Um, and it means that when we fund organizations leading this work, they have to be, their leadership has to be reflective of communities of color, both at the executive leadership and at the board level. And for the foundation, it means that our board and staff also have to re reflect that diversity, uh, that inclusivity um, at the level. Um, we also provide racial equity trainings for our grantees, but we do that as we also recognize their lived experience and their expertise at doing this work. Maybe they don't have the fancy language, but they sure do have the expertise and the lived experience. Um, what else can I share, share with you? Um, and so we recognize public policy and advocacy as strategies and we fund them, but we have to educate ourselves. And I would say lastly, an example about uh, how we actually practice that and the impact that actually building power has had in the sector is that um, the board participates in this racial equity trainings. We do refresh trainings every year. Uh, we actually just had our first healing session together um, where those of us who are folks of color who have this also as a lived experience can be fully engaged, but we also need to create safe spaces to be able to fully engage in this work. Um, uh, one last thing I'll share is that some of the most exciting work is how we've shared our journey with colleagues in philanthropy. So we've, we've shared with them our journey. It hasn't been perfect, but I think creating a safe space where we tell folks um, we share with folks how we've made this relevant in our grant making, in how we invest, who our investors are, they're folks of color, um, how we even practice our procurement um, with folks of color. I think sharing those stories has really been transformative for our colleagues in the field, for those who are willing and ready to, to lead with this type of systemic um, approach and lifting up racial equity as a framework to their grant making and their foundational practices. Thank you, Alejandra. That, that was within five minutes. You went far, far above and beyond the two to three sentences and it was well worth it as far as explaining what building power means. And on top of that, I think provided about a dozen practices, concrete practices. Um, and I think folks may wanna delve deeper into some of those as far as aligning their work uh, with grantees using their values and uh, up and down the organization with staff and the board. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you. Our next speaker for the opening round is Elizabeth Tan. Uh, Elizabeth Tan is the founder and principal consultant of ETAN Consulting, and she's based in Oakland. She has over 20 years of experience in the, in the philanthropic and nonprofit sectors, primarily in the, in the environmental arena. Uh, before starting her consulting practice in 2011, she worked at, uh, at the multi, she worked at the San Francisco Foundation in the Multicultural Fellowship Program, which is one of the most, I think, incredible programs to bring folks of color, talented folks of color into our field, and also worked as a program officer at the French American Charitable Trust, which has a tr tremendous reputation of supporting the grassroots. Elizabeth. Thank you, Daniel, and thanks in advance to all of our co-presenters and to NCRP. Um, I actually would add, and, and when I thought about building power and how, how to possibly answer Daniel's prompt to do this in two to three sentences without using jargon, um, which I think is key, I actually interest, I went right back to my almost 10 years at Urban Habitat, which is an environmental justice organization based 
in Oakland. And I remembered a story when we were starting a strategic planning session. This was around 2001. And we really weighed the pros and cons of using the words building power in our mission statement. And I want to raise this story quickly because I do think it's still relevant to a lot of the foundations in the room. It definitely is still relevant to the consulting work that I do. And I do work explicitly with nonprofits, um, philanthropic institutions, as well as government agencies that are committed to advancing equity. So this whole question of what is power, how do we build it, who's needed in the room, who benefits from our decisions, all of those questions still remain extremely relevant to the work that I, I do today as a consultant. But back in my urban habitat days, I remember that we talked about it as both a strategy as well as an actual end goal. And from a strategy perspective, like many will say today and in the introduction from Caitlin, building power was essential for achieving any of the, um, both the challenges and opportunities facing low-income communities and communities of color in the region. At the same time, we wanted to be really explicit that regardless of the issue or the campaign, that building power in and of itself is a goal and it's a long-term goal and it's a tough goal to achieve, but that ultimately we wanted to be in the room with the decision makers. So it was, it was more than just protesting outside of the doors of, of policymakers or local officials that we might not agree with. And it was more than designing and building an environmental justice um, set of principles. We really wanted the power to say, we can identify our, our community issues. We, can, um, we have the technical expertise and skill set to actually form policy solutions. And we actually want to be the decision makers at the end of the day. So there's a ton to talk about when it comes to building power, how we do it, and, and what it actually means. And at Urban Habitat, I remember we, we worried a little bit about using building power in our mission statement, because back in 2001, a lot of our funders um, were really clear. You know, we, they did not support community organizing. They were okay with community education, maybe advocacy work, but definitely not community organizing. And so just in reflecting on this webinar today and thinking about who's in the room, it's really exciting to see so many people who are interested in this topic, who are willing to lead with a race and class analysis. Um, and I, I do see a lot of progress as a, as a consultant working in multiple sectors on this issue, but building power still remains, I think, a fundamental goal as well as a strategy that's often um, not well articulated, it's not well funded, a lot of my nonprofit clients still complain a lot that it's really hard to get general operating support. It's really hard to break into the, to the rooms where people really do have power. And so there's a lot of conversation um, about what needs to change and what we can do differently. And I think for me, I'm really excited about this conversation because I do think across multiple sectors, whether we're talking about nonprofits or foundations, and increasingly public sector clients, they're doing fantastic work to really have deep um, impact in their communities. And so I look forward to this conversation if we can really surface um, concrete examples, and I will try to, to bring some to the table later on in the discussion um, about what it really means, what does it look like, who benefits from our decisions, and, and who has power and really who doesn't. So I, I, I heard the the bell from Daniel, so I will, I will close my remarks with that. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth, for your reflections um, on what's at stake in our field, I think, in, in taking on this issue of building power. Thanks. Okay, our, our next um, speaker for the opening round is Rhiannon Rossi, who is Program Officer at the Women's Foundation of California. Um, the Women's Foundation of California is a venerable organization, I think is very well known in particular for the Women's Policy Institute, which cultivates grassroots organizers to take on policy change in California. It's a remarkable program. Uh, Rhiannon uh, previously um, all, lived in Chicago, um, like Alejandra, and served as a philanthropic education officer at the Chicago Foundation for Women. And she's had um, a variety of, um, of experience um, working in, in the nonprofit sector, in development in other areas, and in gender justice. Rhiannon. 
Thank you, Daniel. Um, so at the Women's Foundation of California, I think building power is really at the core of what we do and what we were founded on. Um, we invest in organizations that are led by those most impacted by injustice because we believe that they are the ones who are best situated to design the solutions to the problems that they face. Um, and we recognize the value of leaders coming together from a range of social justice movements to build deeper coalitions and support each other's policy and movement agendas to create real and meaningful change. Um, and that's kind of been the core of our work since we were founded uh, 39 years ago. And um, we have three pillars to our work and those are invest, train, and connect. And in all of our work, we prioritize supporting organizations that are led by cis and trans women of color. Um, and we invest in progressive feminist organizations and efforts along the continuum of power, which means that we're investing um, through our grant making and through our uh, Women's Policy Institute in community organizing, coalition building, policy advocacy, um, civic participation and culture change. Um, and through our Women's Policy Institute, we're increasing the number of grassroots community leaders who are actively engaging in the policy advocate, uh, policy making process. And we train those leaders in public policy advocacy and focus on leadership development at the community level because we know that when those grassroots leaders um, are given the training, um, they help, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. We train the leaders because um, in public policy advocacy and focus on their leadership development at the community level because we know that when grassroots leaders help shape the laws, regulations, ordinances, and government allocations, um, power is shifted to the people um, and it's policies that work for the people. And we also connect our network of community-based leaders, uh, both our Women's Policy Institute alumni and our grant partners with organizations, policymakers, and individual and institutional funders and other advocates in order to advance the collective impact and create lasting change um, in California. And I think one of uh, an impact that I think we're really proud of, that I'm proud of, is um, our Women's Policy Institute has been around for about 15 years now, and we've had more than 30 bills signed into law in the state of California, and these laws have had far-reaching results and one law in particular that I want to lift up is our Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, which extended um, the legal labor protections to more than 100,000 low-wage workers in California, the majority of whom were women. Um, and because of this law, these women um, are able to earn overtime pay. And there's, you know, tens of other examples of policy advocacy that um, we have helped advance and shape through our funding of these grassroots leaders. Thank you, Rhiannon, for your, for your insights. I think the, um, the Women's Policy Institute is really a sterling example of how to build that advocacy capacity and walk alongside grantees, and there's incredible results there. We're now going to pivot to the moderated conversation section, and I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be sharing questions with the panel, and any of the panelists who wish to respond to these um, may reply. All right, the first question is about building alignment within institutions around building power. So the question is, have you experienced challenges or seized opportunities in terms of aligning your foundations at all levels? And that means boards, executives, middle management, grant managers around this goal of building power. And along those lines, are there any moment of truth conversations that you're willing to share that maybe led to growth or positive changes in your organization or in your work? Well, I can jump in and I'll share um, some challenges, I think, that have been really great learning moments at the Woods Fund, um, specifically in reminding our board members that systems change takes time. You know, um, while we provide multi-year grants for organizations, um, there's a good amount, I would say maybe 75% of our funding goes for renewal one-year grants. Mm. And we have to remind board members at times when we're, they're making decisions on grants um, that we can't expect systems change or policy change within a grant cycle or within even a year or two. That systems change takes time and this is long haul work. Um, 
and that sometimes even policy change itself is maybe um, the beginning of systems change because then at least in the state of Illinois, we have really great policies, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there is enforcement, um, oversight, and so um, just that reminder about systems change um, and the long haul work it requires. Um, and so that's, and that's, I think, a grow, that's just, it's a healthy tension that we like to hold and to remind board members. Um, because change can't be evaluated in outputs, um, it, it really requires both, um, I think, uh, a respect for everything involved in systems change and patience, because we're looking to do transformational work and we're looking to fund transformational work. Alejandro, really appreciate your, your, your comments because I think uh, that, that, that patience is one of the most underrated virtues in philanthropy. And all of us who do this work know that, that it's needed. And yet it's often the case that people who sit on boards come from outside the sector. And I think we're all ruled by this gospel of innovation, which is all about disruption. It privileges the new, I think, and the, and the emerging over what's tried and true. And that, that ability to, uh, to educate and align board members around timelines of change and realizing it happens over time and that setbacks can also be um, part of the of, yeah. of social progress. Um, I think that that element of understanding those that sort of calculus and the, the dynamics of how social change happens for folks outside of the sector is really key. Any other kernels around um, that specific conversation, Alejandra? No, I think you've, okay. you've articulated. Thanks for that, summarizing it. Great. Would other panelists like to, to, to take on this question? No? Okay. I'd share, I guess I could share one quick story about, I was recently hired by a funder collaborative, which I, I think it's makes things even trickier because I think everyone enters the conversation with his or her own idea of, of the implications of building power, not only for what it would mean for their grantees, but also for their own institutions. And so the funder collaborative started off with great intentions around really being explicit about supporting um, equity work. Mm -hmm. And then after a nine month period where I, I interviewed a ton of community leaders and, and philanthropic leaders in, um, in all um, parts of the organization, at the end of the day, we did have some really tough conversations because when it came to getting ready to either allocate dollars or to significantly change the way their institution might think about, again, who benefits from their grant making decisions and who doesn't. A lot of the, the program officers who were in the room shared the fact that they were in, they each had different levels of power within their own institutions mm -hmm. to follow through on a lot of these ideas. And I think, um, you know, as a consultant, I didn't have access to the board. I didn't and have you know we had a group of program officers with who were really well intentioned and at the end of the day i think the progress you know we could have made more pro progress if we had um anticipated some of these challenges ahead of time because a lot of the folks in the room were unable to ultimately move their institution as far as they wanted to to significantly allocate resources and to change grant making practices so I would say it was successful in some ways and at the and in other ways, um, that lack of alignment and, and clarity around the decision making within the room harmed the project um, a little bit. I appreciate the way you've actually blown open the question because it's not just a matter of creating alignment within institutions at different levels of, of the organization, board and staff and, and likewise, but I think creating alignment around our ecosystem of funders as we collaborate is, um, you know, it's a game of twister. And um, there, there are, you know, I think with each foundation and even within a foundation, you can have many different cultures um, mm -hmm. and different ways of approaching um, an issue, different ways of collaborating with other funders, different ways of aligning with community. Did you have, have to have any challenging conversations, Elizabeth, with some folks who might, have, might not have been as aligned with the goal of building power? Well, that's it. <laughs> Yes, lots and lots. Um, mm. I think the, and again, kind of going back to my urban habitat days, I think when it, 
when it really comes time to see the implications of our decisions, whether it's a policy recommendation or who's going to receive funding from certain foundations, ultimately we're talking about power. Who has power to influence um, those outcomes? And if you're going to, if you, if your institution does not see a clear win for themselves, people push back. And I think, you know, race and class dynamics just make things even more complicated because there's a real history there to who has power in these decision making arena arenas. And I think um, that's another big issue to talk about at some point. I don't know if it's possible to cover that on this particular webinar, but th those types of questions come up a lot. Um, and some people just aren't comfortable with acknowledging that historically they their institutions have had a lot of power and may not have used it wisely and there are, are tensions there to really um to address honestly and directly so mm -hmm. sometimes my clients are willing to do that and sometimes they really they don't want to push that deeply and they want to just say yes we believe in supporting community organizing and they they take a hands-off approach after that point mm -hmm. Um, I just yeah. want to say for the for the audience that I've forbidden, I've taken a heavy hand and forbidden Elizabeth from saying I'm just a consultant. Um, and in this work of of talking about power, it's often consultants who have the ability, who are who come outside of an institution to say the hard to, to, to raise the hard questions and to raise some of the deep structural issues that um, and 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 issues that folks within are sometimes not able to. And it's one reason why I think for this building power toolkit, it's. We, we really feel that, that consultants play a critical role because they're often brought in to facilitate these conversations. Thank you for raising that. May I add something to that, Daniel? Um, kind of to Elizabeth's point um, and to your point about bringing in consultants, we um, did a lot of work here at the foundation um, internally around our structures of power and how oppression shows up within our staff and um, how we uphold white supremacy within the way our organization is structured and really looking at um, our structures internally and how we work together with uh, as a staff and who holds power and who makes decisions. And so I think it's really important to look at how we work with our grant partners, but it was also really important for us as staff to come together and have those hard conversations about, um, you know, how are we upholding oppression amongst ourselves and one another. Thanks, Rhiannon. So we'll go to our next question now, and it's one that's come up in a number of the, the Q&A, uh, the, the questions raised from participants. And uh, this is one about how do we define success in this work of building power? How do we know we're achieving success? It's a super easy question. Um. <laughs> I'm happy to kind of start, get it kicked mm. off. I think there's a few ways that I think one of the simplest ways is um, we redid how we did our grant making here at the foundation. And so we gave people a myriad of options of how they can go about applying for funding. And one of them was, do you not see, um, is there something missing from here? Do you have another idea? And at the end of that, one of our grant partners sent me an email after they had submitted their um, application. And I just want to quote her. And she just said, I just have to say, I just submitted and thank you to all of you. That was such an easy process. Thank you in all caps. You have no idea how much stress you took off of me and our whole team. And I think that's one really easy way to start looking at how we know this is successful. Um, but I think for the long term, um, I think it's when we've transformed the institution of power. Um, when our community leaders are the ones who are the go-to experts, when they're the ones in the halls of power, they're making policy, um, and, you know, we're hiring people who are impacted um, to work at foundations as opposed to people who maybe just have lots of education, um, and we're really going to our community leaders as our, um, as our um, experts on the issues that we're funding. Thank you. I'll chime in a little bit, Danielle, if you don't mind. I think, um, and I, I'll, I'll go back again to a recent project I work on, worked on for funders who were really interested in this, in this question of how do we advance equity. And what came up a lot um, from all of the social justice organizations and community leaders I interviewed for this, they really emphasized that it, for them it was really around 
community self-determination was, was the kind of the buzzword that, that they surfaced. And I, I like that term because it allowed us to move away from um, issue specific impact or, or having an organization fit into a particular guidelines that the foundations decide um, equate to success. So it really did get at the heart, bringing it back to building power. Um, it really got at the heart of that concept because the groups themselves were saying, we will feel successful, we will feel powerful if we are able to determine our own destinies. And how to do that, of course, is complicated, right? So some of them wanted and saw success in their abilities to fundamentally influence the master plan. And as a result, they wanted access to not just any capacity builder, capacity building support, they wanted transportation planners and engineers to allow them to partner with them so that they were well positioned to really influence decision makers. So from my line of work as a, as a consultant, um, I see a lot of success when um, organizations are fundamentally involved and have the power to stay involved from the very beginning of the process. So when we're talking about identifying community needs and problems all the way through, you know, designing and implementing solutions. I think a lot of challenges have come up when they just don't have the power capacity to stay with the process and that the larger institutions, the more powerful groups, the ones that have access to lobbyists, they're the ones that are going to continue to influence these very important decision makers and the smaller groups just don't have the power, capacity, or resources to hang with them. And so success for them is really around, um, are they well positioned? Do they have the political relationships? Do they have an inside outside strategy to really make a difference over the long term? So that's just one, those are just some indicators of success, but those are some that were defined by the groups themselves. Hmm. And I would just share um, another marker of success is when foundations listen to their grantees and adapt their own practices to be reflective of what grantees, those that are on the ground, are telling us works and doesn't work. Um, you know, I, I also used to run a small nonprofit. I actually was also a grantee of the same foundation I work at. And, you know, I think we've learned a lot. We recently had two listening sessions um, that we had a third party facilitate um, because we know and we want to make sure that we are not creating barriers to, uh, to groups who want to um, become grantees. Um, and so we learned so much about how our own application process um, was actually a barrier to some. Um, and so I think for us, success is when we do a better job at listening and adapting our practices to make sure that they actually don't become barriers to the very work that we want to support. Okay, my next question to the panel is, um, I think this, this work of building power is really a journey. And I'm wondering, what is your advice to peers who are on this call um, who are interested in how foundations can support grantees in building power. So what, the journey, what entry points would you suggest? <laughs> well, I can start. I think for foundations and what has been successful at Woods is that it was an institutional commitment. So when we got our training and somebody had asked, you know, we, the Woods Fund actually used ABFI uh, for our racial equity training. Mm. Um, so we made, we did an all in training. It wasn't just the staff that went to the training, which I think is, I, it seems to be typical. It was the board who made a commitment to going through the training and, and being part of this learning journey together. Um, it doesn't mean it's been perfect and there are some board members who maybe are not as comfortable or uh, maybe come to one training but maybe miss another. But for us, it had to be an all-in. It had to be an institutional commitment. And again, making sure that it was part of our culture or building a culture of learning, um, that we weren't going to figure it all out and we weren't going to have the answers 
So, um, but being okay with having bumps in the road because we are going to have to learn. So I think one, making sure it's a it's an institutional commitment, mm-hmm. and being honest about that this isn't going to be solved overnight. I mean, structural racism. It took hundreds of years to build. It's going to take us a long time, hopefully not that long, to, to dismantle. But this is long haul work and that we have to be patient with ourselves, just as we have to be patient with those on the ground doing the work. I think I would just add, I, I think there's some opportunities to think of this somewhat sequentially. So if an organization or a foundation is not willing to um, radically transform the way they um, distribute funds or uh, who benefits or who does not benefit, there's, there's a lot, I think, I'm really excited about the idea of using um, capacity building and leadership development, you know, areas where funders are often comfortable saying, yes, we, are, we provide capacity or we support leaders. There's a lot of interesting room to work within those fields to directly um, support cutting edge leaders, people of color led organizations that are, are critical to this work. And you could see capacity building as a real way to invest deeply um, and provide customized support that's really gonna allow these organizations to thrive and to be the strong anchor institutions that they need to be in order to move this work forward. So even if, again, you're not prepared to, to um, or if it just takes a long time to address a lot of race and class issues internally, there's still ways that you can, can be creative with your funding and look beyond just your grant making dollars to um, create the space for organizations to really grow and thrive. And I think a lot of the organizations themselves are getting much more sophisticated in their interests and desires to work um, again on an inside outside political strategy. For example, they want relationships with their city council members. They want to understand how to partner effectively with local governments. All of these things speak to building power. And so I think there's a lot of ways in to the door and it, and it doesn't have to feel like a, a giant um, institutional shift that has to happen all at once. Diana, did you wanted to field the question? Yeah, I think, um, you know, to plug the, the Power Move toolkit, I think taking a look at that, and I bet you're already doing a lot of the things or that you're probably very close to some of the entry points and doing things, and it's maybe just um, taking a look at the guide and seeing maybe reframing the way you're doing things already because I think a lot of these practices are probably already happening within a lot of your organizations and I think just kind of taking a step back to evaluate what you're doing and how it fits in with um, the suggestions and the questions um, in the power move guide is really uh, helpful. Great and to that point um, here's my printout of the power moves guide. Uh, I would encourage folks in particular um, even if you have it, um, if you have the, the guide handy, look at pages 19 to 21. Um, there's a set of, of guiding questions in three categories. Um, first, in diversity and inclusion. Secondly, in decision making. And thirdly, in how grant making supports equity and social change. Uh, it brings the wealth of experience um, that, that the NCRP has brought to bear from listening to the nonprofit sector about what works. Um, there's a set of questions that are all entry points into fruitful conversations. Um, just want to emphasize, anyone can whistle. This isn't a vaunted conversation. It's something that, um, if you especially look at pages 19 to 21, uh, provides a wealth of, of insights on, on where to begin. Um, so with that, we have a wealth of questions from the, um, from the audience, and we'll now, we'll, we'll now pivot um, to this. Um, and bear, bear with me. Our first question... Um, comes from Diana Paredes um, at the Seattle Foundation. Her question is, how does your foundation leverage philanthropy to build power through donor advising? And she relates that we have a donor advising department in our foundation. Um, and the part of their role is to channel a greater portion of the Seattle Foundation's dollars to power and movement building for racial and economic e- equity. And Thus far, there hasn't been uh, as much institutional infrastructure to do this successfully. 
Um, and so the, the question is, um, uh, what, 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 what um, tips do you have um, for, uh, for, for donor organizing or leveraging donor organizing through philanthropic advising? Um, and, and using the, uh, all the folks who do philanthropic advising as a channel to, to, to the goal of building power. Any advice? Hmm. I don't work at, I'll, I'll jump in and I don't, um, this issue has come up a lot with, with my foundation clients, especially ones that are, are explicitly saying that they want to move an equity agenda and they realize that a lot of power and resources are tied up in their donors and that if they could just figure out ways to do exactly what, um, what you're talking about, um, they would exponentially be able to be more, that much more effective. So I think um, the degree to which foundations can demonstrate that an, an investment in building power and an equity is going to be a win-win-win for everybody at the table. And I, I do think that requires um, some real detailed strategy and work planning sessions and figuring out partners and, and what's really possible and the specific concrete equity wins that need to happen, I think that can really grab people's attention and get people very inspired to put their dollars towards something that's real. That it's not just kind of a, a concept, you know, uh, or a, a goal that seems almost unattainable, but that the more we can show real wins, real partnerships and the specific role that a donor can play to make that happen. That to me is what people seem to get most excited about. And it, it takes us away from um, theory and jargon and gets really down to problem solving. And I think especially in this political environment, people are probably very hungry if we're talking about equity to really make a difference and to, to know that their expertise and their dollars and that also their relationships, I'd love to throw that one in there. You know, donors and foundations that have access to other people with power, you can bring a ton of that to the table. Um, and that's when I think things can get really exciting and people can feel like there's real movement. So I know that's not a, a great detailed answer, but I think the more we can be clear about what the win is, um, the more we can get people excited and aligned to achieve it. Now, I think... Uh, that, oh, go ahead, Rhiannon. Oh, okay. Um, something that we do at the Women's Foundation in California is we've hosted um, for two years now a Philanthropy and Public Policy Institute, and it's for philanthropists, both institutional and individual, and it's um, a two and a half day program where we train, we talk to philanthropists about why it's important to fund policy advocacy and that you can in fact do it. And so you know, it's a very rich two and a half day long learning experience, but I think one of the most meaningful um, times for the participants is having peer funders come in and talk about why they fund policy advocacy. And again, tell Elizabeth's point, the wins that have happened. And then also meeting the, the community leaders who are being, whose policy advocacy is being funded and talking about their, highlighting their wins um, and what it means to them. So I think, again, like donor education, having peer funders come in and talk about the work that they're doing around building equity and power, um, I think is really important. Yeah, and I'll just echo what Rhiannon had said. I mean, I, the Woods Fund is a private foundation. We don't have, you know, we used to be a family foundation, so we don't have donors that we work with. But I think it's comparable to the landscaping education that you have to do of your board. I mean, exactly to what uh, Rhiannon spoke about um, in, in informing, educating donors and the board about the sector and why community organizing, public policy advocacy and working at the systemic level is effective, I think, um, is, is really important. Um, I mean, I used to work at a community foundation where there really was a lot of hesitancy in pushing donors um, outside of their comfort zone or to fund where, to put their dollars where they have historically. Um, and I think that's a real lost opportunity of not really informing your donors of the sector 
and um, and if your foundation organization is ready to move to fund with the systemic lens and um, lifting up those most impacted um, who are doing advocacy work, it is a lost opportunity. I think um, donors would appreciate um, understanding how you know how effective or how other fellow donors or other board foundation board members are engaging in these kinds of effective strategies and impacting change. Can I just add one more quick idea? You know, we did a recent site visit. We were actually on the bus. You know, the classic model where you, you bring people who are unfamiliar with the communities that you're hoping they're going to invest in and you spend the whole day together and you show tangible results and you also just as importantly, you, you have a mix of people on that bus where they can start to have their own conversations and develop their own relationships and, and get out of kind of their um, predictable networks that they tend to work in. And I think anything what we can do to expose people to one another, because <laughs> it's going to take everybody's and all of their insights and perspectives and resources and find opportunities to bring people um, to the places that we work, to the people that we work with, and, and let them form, or at least start to form some of their own relationships and ability to communicate directly versus having to read it on a piece of paper or try to find the perfect words in a grant proposal. I think that goes a long way over the long term. Uh, I just wanted to really call out that point, Elizabeth. I think that, that so much of, of what, why inequality is widening is because the world are not being brought together. And right. what we can do as grant makers is uh, and especially starting vis-a-vis -vis our boards is, is to bring those worlds together. And I'm going to, um, the, the Levi Strauss Foundation is a corporate foundation. And, you know, the, the folks on our board are, are family members who are trustees of, Levi, of Levi Strauss and Company, but also corporate leaders in the company. And we've, we've had an initiative, and I, there's a book here called Pioneers in Justice that focuses on where we've, where we've supported next-gen leaders of civil rights and social justice communities over a five year horizon. And we're now in our second phase of this. And I think the biggest, one of the biggest um, cultural shifts for us has been having these leaders come and speak at a board meeting once a year. And by just having a panel, hearing about how they're looking at, at, um, at the social justice issues of the day, how they look at, at, um, at change management, um, how they're looking at threats to democracy right now. It's really greased the wheels, I think over time for our our foundation to see, to see community organizers, folks from the grassroots as partners and to really understand the value proposition that they bring to society. They're the first movers when, when bad things happen. They're the, they're the ones who are building bridges in ways that, that no one else can. So I think that by, by having that, that steady drumbeat of, of leaders um, connecting with our board members, it's done work that we can't do on our own, um, either in writing a grant report or in, in presenting. Um, our next question is about how we structure power building in our work, in our, in our grant making. So it's, the question is from Laura Flam, and it, the question is, how do you think about power building in terms of your whole grant portfolio? Um, is the entire portfolio focused on power building, or is it a theme or a lens that's, uh, or a strategy that's invoked within specific um, issue areas or themes? So advice on how, to, how work is structured as far as building power. Well, I would say as a foundation that, that funds at a systems level, um, power building is a thread, it's a strategy, a process throughout, right? Whether it's um, when we fund smaller emerging grassroots organizations are doing power building, but I would say even some of our policy groups are power building um, in creating the conditions for change, right? And so, I don't see it as something separate. I see it as a strategy, a core value, um, a necessity to be able to change conditions. Um, and I would say the same is true for the way that the foundation works. I think there's always, there, there's always um, a need to have uh, a balance, a power balance. We recognize that we are funders and are providing the dollars but we also have to be accountable um, to, to, you know, to who, to our grantees, to ourselves. Um, 
And so power building, I think, is, is a value um, and a necessity for us to really be able to impact systems change. I think similarly to Alejandra, it is also it's built in our grant making. Um, you know, we give our grant part, we fund general operating support um, unless the organization wants something else funded. Um, we give them a myriad of options of how they can go about um, applying for that for that money um, and it's really up to them to choose how they want to apply for the funding and you know I'm happy to have a conversation with every single person so they don't have to do the work um, and I think it's also having an open dialogue with your grant partners um, and checking in with them and just saying like what did you like about this process do you have recommendations for me um, who's doing this well um, and just constantly soliciting feedback with your grant partners and having an open dialogue and conversation with them. Um, and not just about the grant, but just about how things are going, what you can help them with, who can you connect them with. Um, just, just building up that relationship and that trust with them. I'd like to add just one, um, share a conversation that I've been privy to recently and around funders that are, are asking this question as well as the nonprofits that are weighing in on the more of the structure or how to, you know, how can foundations just make a more intentional commitment to, to building this work. And I think um, recently this concept around full cost budgeting and do funders really understand the um, how much, what the real costs are to, to build strong community anchor institutions and our, on the flip side, are the organizations actually showing the real costs of doing their work? So from a practical perspective, when, you, when foundations look at grant sizes, length of grants, who they're funding and who benefits, it can get down to that, a, a real detailed discussion about, you know, are your funding dollars truly covering the cost that your grantees need covered? Um, mm -hmm. To do the type of work that we're talking about and to get out of this kind of starvation cycle of, um, nonprofits going after project-based funding or, or magically creating the budgets that, that match what their foundation's willing to offer. And if they follow that model, they are, um, success often is just defined by, oh, well, we've met our budget goals, but they're not necessarily in a position to move their agenda and, and move their equity priorities forward. So the degree to which foundations can really have honest conversations and develop those partnerships with their grantees. So they're looking at the level of funding, the length of funding and the true costs and how to cover that. I think that would go a really long way in, in having your foundation um, take an honest look at, at how well it is uh, uh, providing support for these types of groups. Okay, our next question comes from Kendra Hicks, and she asks, what are some of the hardest things about funding in a way that builds power? Hmm. I mean, I think the challenge that I had shared before about the long haul, the patience, right? Things um, do are not linear. Change is not linear. Um, and, and that there are always uh, external forces at play. For instance, um, we've got some amazing organizations in the Chicago region doing great work on uh, workers' rights, criminal justice reform. Uh, you know, but we've got um, state leadership uh, that is uh, very challenging to say the least. Uh, the state of Illinois went without a state budget for nearly three years. And so I think uh, power building, power building um, is really important. Um, but there are always external forces at play. And I would also say, you know, we also fund um, emerging and grassroots organizations that I would say are more movement builders. Um, they call to question um, a number of things. Um, for instance, we, we fund groups that are, I would say, more abolitionists versus reformers and have really challenged 
the Chicago Police Department, <laughs> who have really challenged um, the Sheriff's Department and their engagement in ICE detentions and deportations. And so that, that kind of power building is very, very difficult and can be frowned upon in philanthropy. Um, it's not linear, but it's really important towards changing the conditions in which change can happen. Um, and so I think so, those are some of the challenges, you know, uh, so building the patience. And I think something else, um, some language that I learned when I broke into philanthropy is this whole risk assessment. You know, how um, comfortable is the foundation in putting dollars into work? Maybe that's more direct action, more movement building um, that makes some people uncomfortable. Uh, and that may be seen as a, a risky investment. Um, I think it's getting over the unknown, getting over ourselves in, in our own personal comfort levels um, of the, le the, the, the level of um, civic engagement when then maybe we're not comfortable with it anymore. So I think those are some of the fears that we have to resolve and it requires again back to educating our board or our donors about um, what we're willing to support and why. I'll add a quick um, example of work that I was doing with the community foundation who uh, was explicitly talking about moving towards a, an equity agenda and really recognizing the need for long-term general operating support grants that were larger than what they were used to giving. And as a result, mm -hmm. as they work to research and justify why certain grantees would um, end up with more resources at the end of the day, they were gonna mm -hmm. have to make some tough decisions and say no to other grantees that um, were expecting them as a community foundation to provide um, those types of small responsive grants. So if the foundation is gonna move towards a more um, explicit equity focus and agenda, you may run into that challenge where some of your organizations will benefit and they'll get the longer term support, general operating, and you may have to let go of some others and, and you're gonna have to justify mm -hmm. that. And those are tough decisions. It may be that you're moving away from an issue-based strategy and, move, and moving more towards a power building strategy. And that will change the way that you talk about the work it should change the way that, you know, how you partner and ultimately who's going to um, benefit from your influence and power. Great. Well, the, the time has just flown by. It's hard to believe an hour and 15 minutes is passing by so quickly. I just like, I'm, I'm gonna bring the, the passive aggressive California Zen Bell as a, as a note of applause, a virtual applause for our incredible panelists. Um, I think you all can see that these are folks who are, and, and these are foundations um, and consultants who are leading the way as far as how foundations can help, can, can get out of our own ways in some cases, and really do the hard work of, of helping grantees build power in the community. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Rhiannon, for sharing your insights, your wisdom, your experiences. Um, I'm going to call on each of you before we have some closing thoughts from Caitlin to give a one or two sentence um, closing thought, whether it's something you didn't get a chance to say, something you wanna leave, leave folks with or a resource. And um, I'll give you a second to think about that. In the meantime, encourage all those on the, on the webinar to please uh, download Power Moves. I can tell you it's actually a really fun read. It's very well laid out. Um, it's not dense um, in the ways that some foundation works can be. It offers a wealth of entry points into how a foundation can have real conversations around building power. And hopefully that anyone can be empowered to sort of uh, to, to, to raise their hands and have these conversations um, that really do matter. So with that, we'll go in reverse order. How about Rhiannon first? A closing thought. Yeah, I think just to follow up what Daniel said, I mean, I think the, the power... Um, Moves toolkit is really um, useful. And as I mentioned earlier, I think I understand that everyone's coming from different places and there's different structures, both community foundations, family foundations. And so everyone's working within a different structure. 
but I think it's really useful to kind of take a look, assess where you are, what are you already doing that um, is building power that maybe you're not aware of, and just um, go from there. I think this is a hot topic in philanthropy right now, and a lot of people are talking about it, and I think the Power Moves Toolkit really gives you the tools to start to examine that and start to make moves and um, put your money where your values are. All right. Elizabeth. Great. I, I would, I'm just really excited that we had this conversation that people are willing to speak really openly about what's working and what's not working. And one issue that, that um, we didn't have a chance to cover that I would just encourage people to track is the fact that there are now, you know, equity leaders, for lack of a better word, sprinkled all over the place. They're not just in the nonprofit world. They're not just in philanthropy. They're in the public sector. They're in the academic sectors. So the more that we can think about the specific roles that each of our institutions and sectors can play while realizing that no single sector has the power to ultimately um, make meaningful change on its own. I would just encourage people as they explore this work to really reach out and develop you know, new partnerships and find your allies outside of your predictable networks to really scale the impact that you can have and for foundations to think beyond just grant making and really think about um, their access to donors, strategic relationships, um, other institutional leaders, and how to, to really put all of your um, resources on the table for this work. Yeah, so um, be brave, mm. be patient, um, build community both around you and your needs, I think, for those program officers or staff, leaders, um, build community and champions around this effort, but also around you. I would say as a um, Latina immigrant working in philanthropy, I also have had to build community to support my work and to be brave. Luckily, I work at a phenomenal place, mm -hmm. but I think we need to build community as we do it. These are tough times, but definitely be bold and brave and be patient. Well, deepest thanks to all of our panelists, not only for bringing your wisdom and your insights to this conversation, but really bringing your full selves to this work and really answering our call um, in philanthropy. Um, to support the communities that we serve. I, want to, I do want to acknowledge before, we, before I close on my part is that there were some unanswered questions and we will be following up. Caitlin and the team will be following up by email. There's some, there are also some requests for resources. Um, one more um, round of thanks for our panelists. And with that, I'll turn it over to Caitlin. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you to Alejandra, Elizabeth, and Rhiannon for this really, really rich discussion. We really appreciate all of your insights and challenges um, for us to do more. Um, so I wanted to mention some other resources for folks who are joining us. Um, Power Moves builds on extensive work by NCRP, Change Philanthropy Partners, foundations, and other research and advocacy organizations, including our co-sponsor, FCCP, um, our good friends um, at Justice Funders, and of course, the Black Social Change Funders Network. So um, we encourage you to check them all out and to also check out the online Power Moves reading list to learn more about the other resources that can inform your journey. Um, and if you haven't already, feel free to share some relevant resources that you found useful in the chat box or by emailing me and I'll be following up um, next week. Um, for the nonprofits and grant seekers joining us today, if you want to learn more or recommend a, a funder to use Power Moves, my colleague Janae Richmond would love to hear from you, and I'll include her contact information in the follow up email. We also have a forthcoming Power Move blog post with recommendations for action steps you can take and encourage the funders um, and consultants online to also share that with um, nonprofits and grant seekers in your network. So thank you again to everyone who joined us live and participated in the Q&A and chat box. And thank you to our speakers and co-sponsor who helped us make this conversation possible. On Monday, you'll receive a follow-up email with a list of resources that were mentioned in this presentation, including a link to the recording and a recap blog post from NCRP.
Our next uh, Power Moves webinar will be held the week of September 17th, so stay tuned for more information. And we invite you to stay engaged with NCRP and our movement to transform philanthropy as a nonprofit member or a foundation supporter. Um, so you can contact me and the rest of us on our Power Moves team as well for soft coaching on how to get started with the toolkit. We'd love to hear from you. Um, lastly, please fill out the webinar feedback survey that will appear on your screen and we thank you and we hope you have a good rest of your day and your week. Thanks everyone.